any of you don't know me, uh, my name is Jenny Clevy. I've been a member here for 33 years, yeah, 1991. Um, so my children were, uh, almost, uh, were eight and four when we joined. So, um, and I've been involved with Stephen Ministry from the beginning, of, well, it would be like six years ago now when we first trained. So. I'm very happy, delighted to be here for all the reasons aforementioned, <laughs> and, and just, to, just to see you all also. So would you mind, real quick, I know most of you, but I don't know all of the names, so could we just go through and give me your names? I'm Cheryl. Cheryl. Jeff. Jeff. Don. Don. Jill. Jill. Pastor Ann. Linda. Linda. Dee. Herbert. Joanne. Julie. Steve. Marion. Julie. Oh, thank you. Thank you all for coming. So, do I need to? Do I need to? Do I project okay? Or do I need to use the, the mic? So, um, you've got the kind of handouts in front of you. We're not going to go over all of that today, but I wanted to give also something to reflect on afterwards if you're so inclined to do so. Um, and I listed my sources uh, at the top. So today we want to talk a little bit about the life and death of Saint Stephen and. Um, within the context of what was happening that was the very early days of the development of the Christian church um, and the the the, um, uh, the, uh, the only place where St. Stephen is mentioned is the book of Acts and specifically Acts chapter 6 to the first couple of verses of chapter 8 and that that's it so and at the beginning of the Acts, as you may know, we, all, we have Jesus on earth and it talks about his, after his resurrection, and it talks about the time between his resurrection and his ascension into heaven. So, and as we all know, we keep in mind that, as he said, he's here, he was there throughout all this, he's here with us now. Oh, thank you, Jesus. So, um, So the purpose of Acts is to give an accurate account of the birth and growth of the Christian church. And I always like to say when we talk about the Bible and accuracy, it's different. Their accuracy is different from what we would determine as factual accuracy. Um, the accuracy is that the message is always um, accurate. Sometimes the dates and the chronology aren't necessarily accurate. These, the Bible comes from different sources and scholars who put it together then and who study it now. There are some discrepancies, but there's no discrepancy in the basic message. Um, now Luke, who wrote Acts as a sequel to the Gospel of Luke, uh, as we know, was a Gentile physician. So he was real, um, um, dedicated to getting the uh, accuracy as he could, but he, but he was not, Luke, uh, Luke was not present at all of these events, so he is also putting together eyewitness accounts. And as we know, eyewitness accounts always vary. You can be right next to somebody at an event and you know, even a couple weeks later, each of you will give an account that has some discrepancies in it. So, <coughs> the book of Acts was written in the common era, era between year 63 and 70. So, again, that's good generation after Jesus ascended. And it was a sequel to his gospel. The, the scholars believe because of the way the book of Acts ends, it kind of ends abruptly. Scholars believe Luke had intended to write a third book, as you, as you call it, or write more, and never got to it, or we never found it. So um, he was actually, he was not, again, he was not a first person witness to the events we're going to be talking about today, but he was a companion and co-traveler with Paul and um, on his missionary journeys, and we know that because in Later chapters of Acts 16 to 28, he mentions we when he talks about the traveling. So both of the books are addressed, Luke and Acts are addressed to Theophilus. And the meaning of Theophilus is one who loves God. And so 
Theophilus could have been Luke's patron who helped finance his writing, possibly a Roman acquaintance of Luke who had a strong interest in the new Christian religion, or he may have been a made-up name to refer to all the believers in Christ. Um, neither which way one who loves God is really fun to kind of contemplate and think, or think about. Um, so Acts was, um, Luke was first mentioned in Acts 6, verse 5, as a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. I read that and I just have to take a pause and I'd like to take us, us to take a pause and just let that soak in a little bit. A man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. What do those words mean to you? What would it be like for you to be referred to as someone full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Perhaps you are referred to that way. Mm. Are these words true for you? Let's just ponder that for a moment. So as an introduction for today's topic, um, I'd like us to do this short two and a half minute video so it gives us a a good summary of what we know about St. Stephen. Okay, should I, do I just press OK here? Um, on the silver remote, oh. I'll press the center circle. Oh, thank goodness for technology. <coughs> St. Stephen was one of the first ordained deacons of the church and the first Christian martyr. While working among the early Christians, the apostles heard a complaint that their Greek-speaking widows were being neglected during the distribution of alms. The twelve decided to appoint seven deacons to oversee this distribution and ensure fairness. Of the seven deacons, Stephen was the oldest and given the archdeacon title. He was full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Stephen's popularity created enemies among some Jews. Members of the synagogue of Roman freedmen entered a debate with Stephen and accused him of blasphemy. Filled with wisdom, Stephen won his debate. The Jews did not accept this outcome. Stephen was put on trial, and several false witnesses were brought forward by the Sanhedrin to testify he was guilty of blasphemy. Stephen responded to these charges by detailing the history of Israel and outlining the blessings God had bestowed upon the nation. As Stephen concluded his defense, he looked up and saw a vision of Jesus standing at the right hand of God. He said, Look, I can see heaven thrown open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. The angry crowd rushed upon Stephen in disbelief and carried him outside the city to stone him. As Stephen was stoned to death, he spoke his last words. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Following these words, Stephen died. In 415, a priest claimed he had a vision of Stephen's tomb and located his remains. The name inside the tomb confirmed Stephen's identity. St. Stephen is often depicted with stones, a gospel book, a miniature church, and a martyr's palm frond. He is the patron saint of bricklayers and deacons. His feast day is celebrated on December 26th. Just press the silver button again? Yeah, aim it towards the top of the TV. Aim it at the TV? Yes. And one more. There. People tell me they're not really gremlins in there, but you couldn't <laughs> prove it by me. From, from day one, it's always been gremlins between me and, and uh, technology. So, <clears throat> does anyone here besides me remember going to church on December 26th to celebrate the Festival of St. Stephen. I'm not surprised, it's not a big thing. <laughs> I think it's a bigger thing in Europe, but um, I went to Milwaukee Lutheran High School and the choirs always sang at that service which was held at St. Stephen's, which is on the south side. Um, I don't know if they still have that service today. St. Stephen's still does exist right along the expressway uh, on Fort, what was that, 43, the one closest to the lake. Um, and it's also called, um, it has two titles. One is St. Stephen's Lutheran Church, and the other one is the Spanish version, Spanish-speaking version of St. Uh, 
uh, Stevens Lutheran Church, so it, it serves um, a Hispanic community there. I'm not sure if they have services in both languages or not, but we would always go because the choir would sing and it was a well-attended service. Um, and I always used to think, oh, we just had how many services and now we get to go again the day <laughs> after Christmas. <laughs> so, um, so as the video tells us, Stephen was one of seven men described as well-respected and full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. So in chapter six, we learn that Stephen was chosen along with six other men, prayed over and received the laying on of hands as their installation to the duties for which they have been chosen. And I really just like knowing that because we do frequent installations here too. We're hopefully about to install a new senior or lead pastor and but we do installations of our Stephen ministers, of our church council, of our Sunday school teachers, and I always find that very meaningful. Um, so let's take a look at the circumstances that led to this point. Um, and the, the reference that of, uh, above of Barclay says, as the church grew, it began to encounter the problems of an institution. In the synagogue, there was a routine custom. Two collectors went round the market and the private houses every Friday morning collecting um, for the needy, partly in money and partly in goods. And later in the day on Friday, which at sundown was of course Sabbath, the collection was distributed. Those who were temporarily in need received enough to enable them to carry on. Those who were permanently unable to support themselves received enough for 14 meals, which would be two meals a day for the week until the next collection time. In addition to this, a house-to-house -house collection was made daily for those in pressing need. The early Christian church had taken over this custom. So to understand what happened next, we need to review a little bit of history. In Jerusalem at the time, there were two kinds of Jews. One kind were the Jerusalem and the Palestinian Jews who spoke Aramaic. Barclay says, these Jews were descendants of the ancestral language and prided themselves that there was no foreign admixture in their lives. The other kind were Jews from foreign countries who had likely to come up to Jerusalem for the feast of Pentecost and made the great discovery of Christ. Many of these had been away from Palestine for generations, so they spoke only Greek. Barclay again writes, the natural consequences was that the spiritually snobbish Aramaic-speaking Jews looked down on the foreign Jews. This contempt affected the daily distribution of the alms, and there was a complaint that the widows of the Greek-speaking Jews were being possibly deliberately neglected. The apostles felt they ought not to get themselves mixed up in a matter like this, so the seven were chosen to straighten out the situation. Uh, it is extremely interesting to note that the first office bearers to be appointed were chosen not to talk, but for practical service. So that's Barclay's viewpoint. At least one of the other sources I consulted leaned more toward the perspective that this neglect was unintentional, possibly due to the differences in language between, between the groups. Um, so it's not a discussion for today, but in either case, this might form the basis of a rich discussion on welcoming or shunning strangers in our midst. And strangers can be anywhere from somebody who's coming from down the street to a person who is homeless walking in to somebody <coughs> who <coughs> is even out into the community and never sets foot in St. Matthew's. The apostles, whom our text says, proclaim the appointment of these seven men would provide them the opportunity to, quote, give our undivided attention to prayer and to the service of the word. The Anchor Bible source says, even if there was public Jewish support of the poor, the church was at that time already being prosecuted by, persecuted by the Jews, so that the poor who had turned Christian could no longer count on support, but rather on persecution on the part of the Jewish authorities. And then they make the comment, which I find also very interesting. Financial discrimination nearly always appears well in advance of actual physical persecution. Um, the inter interpreter's Bible says, Christians, as well as their Jewish forebears, took their social responsibility seriously. And the need of an individual was the responsibility of the group. 
I think St. Matthew's is a good example of, of living that out. Um, and yet we also live in a culture that super prides itself on individual responsibility and, and individuality rather than group responsibility. Hopefully that's, that's changing and we're always developing. So, um, and in, uh, the, in, in ter the Interpreter's Bible also makes the point uh, regarding the laying on of hands. The right is the formal sign of appointment to office as it was in the admission of new members of the Sanhedrin. So it was an, an important right as we do it today as well. The seven appointed were traditionally regarded as the first deacons. Luke implies that they were to be responsible for the fair distribution of alms. Luke does not actually call them deacons, but uses the words distribution, which literally translate into services, and the verb serve. As we know the term deacon from other New Testament books, the deacon appears to have been an assistant to the bishop in the conducting of the Eucharist, ordering of discipline, and the organization of <coughs> psalms, of owls, or not psalms. The interpreter's Bible suggests that because this, the uh, seven appointed here were only appointed regarding the distribution of alms, that they um, would more accurately be referred to as the first elders. Um, it's from this account of the apostles needing others to help meet the needs of early believers that the name Stephen Ministry here at St. Matthew's is taken. Pastor Ann, can I call on you to say a few words about that, how you think about the term um, Stephen Ministry? You, you talked about it at, on Thursday, about how Oh, um, um, the, the founder must have, been, well, how you imagined he was thinking about it. Yeah, so um, the Christians are being persecuted in Jerusalem at this time, and lots of people have actually fled. Um, but the apostles are staying, the uh, original disciples are staying. And they are trying to get the word out. They're trying to spread the message of Jesus. And then this very practical problem happens that happens you know, in every human institution, right? There are these kind of day-to-day -day things that you have to deal with. Mm -hmm. And so it happens for the early church, too. There's people who are hungry, right? And, and it doesn't say why, necessarily, but the apostles don't want to get into that. They want to, all they want to do is preach and tell the good news. So they, um, they appoint uh, these seven men, and when you read it in the Bible, all of them have Greek names. So they appoint people who are from the community that is being um, denied the alms or not getting their fair share of alms. So they appoint people who can speak the language of these widows that are being neglected and give them real power and authority in the life of the early church. And um, Stephen Ministry takes its name from St. Stephen because Stephen ministers are um, called to do some of the work that the, the pastor can't do all by him or herself. Um, to take care of people, not just perhaps um, when a person has died, but weeks later, when someone is still grieving, right? And the pastor is on to the next funeral or to the next sermon or to the next thing. Stephen ministers are there to take care of the, the very practical things that come along with regular life, right? With loss, with grief, with um, uh, a crisis of faith, all the kinds of things that people seek out a Stephen minister for. So that's where that name comes from, and I think it, it uh, lifts up that story that we don't often hear about 
in church about St. Stephen? I mean, how many of you knew anything about St. Stephen before just now, right? <coughs> so, um, is that what mm -hmm. you were yeah. hoping for? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> I didn't mean to put I can't remember spot. what I said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She's good at on the cuff stuff. <laughs> um, yeah, ex exactly. Um, Stephen Ministry was founded in 1976 in St. Louis, and it was a one individual, an ordained, actually happened to be Missouri Synod Lutheran minister, who was just starting his ministry, so he was still in his 20s, and he was at a congregation and quickly overwhelmed by all the needs. And, and job, all the administrative and Eucharist and sermons and everything else he found, there were so many people that needed continuing presence, continuing spiritual and emotional care. And so he was the one who came up with this idea of forming, teaching, uh, to training lay people in the church to be able to accompany other people who were going through life challenges. And I have to insert a plug in here, an unpaid announcement that we are currently recruiting for some new, so there's, how many do we have active? 15 Stephen ministers? But we are going to be running late, um, late winter, early spring. We're gonna be starting a new training class for individuals who think they may be called to do this. And if you raise your hand or come and say you have to do it, and you wanna do it, it's not like, yeah, you have to commit at that point. There's a discernment process where we can talk to you more about <coughs> how you feel your calling is in this area and if it's the right fit for you before you commit to going through this. So um, if you're interested in that, talk to, talk to me, talk to Sue, talk to Pastor Ann. Um, or talk to Carl Johnson if you'd like to get more information. And that's why somebody's usually out in the front too at the Stephen Ministry counter. You can talk to them as well. So, um, yeah. In, in from those early, fairly humble be beginnings, um, Stephen Ministry throughout the world has grown in the last coming up on five decades to encompassing 13,000 congregations for more than 190 Christian denominations, that doesn't have to be Lutheran, across the US, Canada, and 30 other countries. More than 600,000 lay people have received Stephen Minister training to provide high quality, one-to-one, -one, Christ centered care to people in the congregation and the community experiencing life's difficulties. Over 75,000 pastors and lay leaders have been equipped as Stephen leaders and more than one and a half million people have had a Stephen minister walk with them during tough times. So I can't even fathom what it must be like to the founder, Ken Houck, am I getting that right? Um, still is active with it. He's gotta be pushing 80, which as we all know, isn't old at all. <laughs> old at all. But um, he is still very active with it and has plans to expand in a lot of ways. It's already like, uh, they're working with high schoolers, for instance, in a, in a couple of locales. And, you know, kind of every Stephen minister that I know, including myself, have said, these skills aren't just for this particular thing. The skills taught in the training are life skills, relationship skills, that it's used in every aspect of your life. So continuing on in the text, we find that right after this installation, all seven of these men comport themselves not just as administrators, and by just I don't mean that that's a lowly thing, but, but as missionaries. And Stephen and Philip in particular at once assume an almost apostolic prominence in aggressive evangelism. So they're out there, they're preaching. They are out there big time. This fact also distinguishes the seven men from what was later referred to as a deacon. So as Luke writes, Stephen, full of grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. So he also was doing miracles out there, which as you can imagine, ticked off a lot of the traditional um, religious people of the time. Stephen's abilities and his fearlessness in using those abilities got him into trouble. Men, as the video says, men from the synagogue of freed slaves 
who were Jews from Cyrene, Alexandria, Cilicia, and the province of Asia started to debate with Stephen, but they couldn't stand up against him. Stephen's, Stephen's voice, the spirit in Stephen was too powerful. They couldn't win their argument. So these members of the synagogue of freed slaves formed a plot and recruited men to lie and say that they had heard Stephen blaspheme Moses and God. The elders and scribes then seized Stephen and brought him to the Sanhedrin where they bore false witness against him. So here, for me at least, the plot thickens. Barclay writes, the church's appointment of these seven men had far reaching consequences. In essence, the great struggle had begun. The Jews always looked on themselves as the chosen people, but they had interpreted chosen in the wrong way. Regarding themselves as chosen for special privilege and believing that God had no use for any other nation. At their worst, they declared that God had created the Gentiles to be fuel for the fires of hell. At their mildest, they believed that someday the Gentiles would become their servants. They never dreamed that they were chosen for service to bring all people into the same relationship with God as they themselves were to enjoy. Here was the thin ed end of the wedge. This is not yet a question of bringing in the Gentiles. It is Greek-speaking Jews who are involved. Not one of the seven chosen has a Jewish name, and one of them, Nicolaus, was a Gentile who had accepted the Jewish faith. So we're not just talking about, you know, don't go out into all the world. We're talking about a, a smaller group of fellow Jews. The source anchor says, like the false witnesses in Jesus' trial, these witnesses maintain that Stephen had quoted Jesus as saying that he would destroy the temple and change the rules that Moses gave them. Later on, these same accusations would also be made against Paul. More to the real sticking point, Barclay says, Stephen had a vision of a world for Christ. To the Jews, two things were specially precious, the temple, where alone sacrifice could be offered and God could truly be worshiped, and the law, which could never be changed. Um, if you know anything about your Old Testament history, you'll know that all through the wanderings in um, before they got into Canaan, after they left Egypt, all through those 40 years of wanderings, they carried around a temple that was in a, in a tent, and they didn't have a real temple, but many people for centuries craved having a temple. And as we know, David really wanted to build that temple for God, but it turned out that his son actually built it, which created its own problems. Stephen said that the temple must pass away that the law was but a stage toward the gospel, and that Christianity must go out to the whole wide world. None could withstand his arguments, and so the Jews resorted to force. Barclay goes on to say that Stephen's career was to be short, but he was the first to see that Christianity was not the perquisite of the Jews, but God's offer to all the world. So, Stephen is accused of blaspheme and uh, going against the law and all kinds of things, none of which was really true. Um, but in his defense, he doesn't address that. Um, again, Pastor Ann, mm -hmm. do you remember what you said on Thursday about that? <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's some really interesting parallels between St. Stephen mm -hmm. and Jesus, actually. <clears throat> so um, there are some charges trumped up against him, just like there were against Jesus. He goes before um, a court, just like Jesus went before the court. And he's a, the accusation brought against Stephen is blasphemy. And so they give him a chance to speak, but Stephen doesn't speak to the accusation of blasphemy. <coughs> and I think it's because he knew it didn't matter what he was going to say, right? If, if they can trump up charges against him, they can do whatever they want, right? So he instead uses it as an opportunity to preach the gospel. And he never addresses the fact that he's been accused of blasphemy. And I, I can't imagine the courage that that would take, right? Like if somebody made up a charge against me, I'd be like, no, no prove to me when I <laughs> blasphemed against. 
uh, the law and Moses, right? And it, he knows that this is the end for him. So he uses those last minutes of his life to preach the gospel. And then um, as he's being stoned, he says, um, I, I, I give you my spirit, just as Jesus gives God his spirit on the cross, and forgive these people. They don't know what they're doing. So there are these uh, very interesting parallels between Jesus and Stephen, who is the first uh, martyr for the Christian church. But I just find that that's so courageous. You know, he, he kind of knew it didn't matter that he could fight the false charges all that he wanted, but he knew he was going to lose. It's so moving, I guess. <laughs> Just kind of get caught up in the motion of it. Thank you, Pastor. So in Acts 7, verses 1 to 53, which is basically the major portion of this whole text that we're looking at today, we're given an account of Stephen's talk in front of the Sanhedrin. And to Pastor Ann's point, the anchor resource said, in the apostolic times, the speech of the accused on trial did not defend himself so much as the cause that he supported and represented. So Stephen wasn't the only one who took this tact. Stephen covered the history of the Jews from Abraham to Joseph and forward to the history of Moses. So I think in many ways he was refuting what the charges were, but it, I also, again, I'm thinking about him going all the way back to early times to uh, preach the gospel and, and make that connection is also just full of wisdom. So content-wise, Stephen goes back to recount in broad strokes Jewish history. Abraham being told by God to leave the country and go, and Abraham, a man of faith and hope, answering God's summons, then continuing it with Abraham's son Isaac, and Isaac's son Jacob, and Jacob's 12 sons, one of whom was Joseph. And as we know, Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers, um, went into Egypt, and after many decades, through some miraculous occurrences, he became high up in the Egyptian political hierarchy and a great famine in the land and his father, not knowing where Joseph was, thinking he was dead all these years, sent Joseph's sons to Joseph um, and eventually the whole family was reunited in Egypt and then of course after generations after that the Egyptians were in, uh, the Egyptians enslaved the Israelites, and it goes on from there. Uh, and then we come to the birth and life of Moses, again from Barclay. For the Jew, Moses was above all the man who answered God's command to go out quite literally, the man who gave up a kingdom to answer God's summons to be the leader of his people. Stephen's continuing point, the great one is not the person who, like the Jews, is bound to the past and jealous of his or her privileges, he or she is the one who is ready to answer God's summons and leave the comfort and the ease he or she might have had. That one gives me chills, too. <laughs> Stephen continues his account of history through the Jewish people's unfaithfulness to God in the time of Moses to the time of David and David's son Solomon, who built a temple to God. Stephen says, but the Most High does not dwell in houses made with hands. Whew, to somebody who believes you can only, only worship God in that bricks and mortar or whatever was made of temple, that does sound like blasphemy. Stephen maintains that this fixed temple built by man was due to a misconception of God and his nature. Stephen recounts the people's continued disobedience through the time of all the prophets in the Old Testament and insists further that the Jewish people have wrongly limited God. They had come to worship this temple instead of worshiping God. They insisted on a Jewish God who lived in Jerusalem rather than a God of all people whose dwelling is the whole universe. Stephen further states that they have consistently persecuted the prophets that God had spoken to them through Abraham, Joseph, Moses, and others, but the fathers had not obeyed the Holy Spirit who spoke through them. 
and that they have murdered the Son of God, and he claims that the people did not do so out of ignorance, but out of rebellious disobedience. And the whole place goes up in smoke. The Sanhedrin, it says, they were enraged. Acts says, their very hearts were torn with vexation, and they gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen was full of the Holy Spirit, and he gazed steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at God's right hand. So there he is in the moment of truth for him and knowing that the end was near, just seeing God right in front of him. The body shouted with a great shout and held their ears and launched themselves at Stephen in a body. They flung him outside the city and began to stone him. And what I read is that the depiction in the video was very accurate in that there was actually a place dug deep into the ground that people who were to be stoned were thrown into. And if that fall itself didn't kill them, well then they would finish it off with lots of heavy stones. What a way to go. Huh? Um, Stephen's time on earth had been short. His birth is listed as common era, era 5 and his death as common era 34 making him just 29 years old. And what I also read that in that time, if you survived infancy, which was a you know, high, high infant mortality rate, but if you survived your infancy and toddlerhood, you could reasonably expect to live into your mid-50s. Mm -hmm. So his life was maybe half of that. The interpreter's Bible said, had, Joseph, had Stephen lived, he would have ranked with the greatest of the apostles. I think he already does, right? His career can hardly have lasted more than a few months or even weeks. So from the time he was chosen and installed to the stoning was a very short period. The penalty for what the people accused him of, blasphemy in the Old Testament Torah, was stoning to death. Yet this had been no judicial trial, and the Sanhedrin had no right in those days to put anyone to death. So I think some of the uh, scholars also kind of debate whether it was actually the Sanhedrin who ordered this and did this, or whether it was just general, the general mob that the Sanhedrin probably stirred up to do this, kind of a lynching, so to speak. The scholar Lake in the Interpreter's Bible is inclined to think that Stephen's whole speech, which bears very little relation to the charges brought against him, may be a composition by the author of Acts inserted into the count of Stephen's stoning. He says, the general character of the speech seems to fit in very well with the theory that it represents either good tradition as to what Stephen really did say, or at least what a very early Christian would have wished him to say. All observation shows that religious or political prisoners when brought into court never attempt to rebut the accusations brought against them, as Pastor Ann said, but use the opportunity for making a partisan address. <laughs> Um, Barclay says, to Stephen came the peace which comes to one who has done the right thing, even if the right thing kills him or her. God, give us courage to, to respond that same way if we should come to that. So then we, it, the, our text goes into the first couple of verses of chapter 8. The first murmurings of the great debate about the acceptance of the Gentiles. Stephen had had a mind far above national delimitations. The death of Stephen was the signal for an outburst of persecution which compelled the Christians to scatter and to seek safety in the remoter districts of the country. Persecution scattered the church abroad, and where they went, they took the gospel. And then it tells us that Saul, who was of course later called Paul, was at Stephen's stoning and very much in agreement with the stoning. And it's, but and at the same time, it made a strong impression Years after his conversion, Paul himself referred to being an eyewitness during his conversation with God in a vision during a prayer. He is um, confessing to God that yes, he was an early and very zealous prosecutor of the early church. Okay, so let's go back a little bit again and talk a little bit more about the, uh, the speech that Stephen made. Stephen, in making the case that in the fixed temple, rather than the easily moved <coughs> place of worship which, which preceded the temple for centuries, there was a danger of idol worship and a completely wrong conception of God as dependent on men and the work of their hands. 
Stephen was not an enemy of the temple, but of a temple that had lost its nomadic character and had ceased to be God's holy place, and had instead become a place for men's or women's and women's chosen worship of a God in their own image. Don't we all like to do that a lot? We we, we so much limited limit who God is and, and how she is by defining it in terms that are familiar to us as human beings. The Interpreter's Bible says, Stephen's significance is that his preaching in the Hellenistic synagogues made it evident that Christianity was something more than just a new Jewish sect and that its spread would involve danger to the law of Moses. He drove in the first wedge between Judaism and Christianity and made possible the emergence of a distinctly <coughs> Christian church, hence the attack on him by his fellow Hellenist Jews. So he was running into two obstacles, nationalism and traditionalism. He was accused of blaspheming Moses. That was an offense against nationalism. He was also accused of blaspheming God. That was an offense against, offense against religious traditionalism. He attacked two things that Jews held precious, the Holy Land and the Temple. He was not against either of these. He sought to expand beyond these things to make room for a new way of thinking and believing and acting through <coughs> Christ. He knew that God could get along without the Holy Land or Temple, but the people themselves had made these things on par or greater than God. This, and this is, I, I love this, and we could spend, I think, weeks talking about this and exploring this. Um, the Interpreter's Bible says, Jesus knew that truth was a growing discovery made possible by the ever-increasing self-disclosure of God to people. And we know that God continues to disclose who she is today in this time. Jesus was born into a system of law and ceremony. The law in itself was essentially good, and the ceremony in itself was a true representation and dramatization of the Jewish idea of sacrifice. But he recognized that the system had run away with things. Instead of saving people, it was enslaving them. Instead of making them good, it was making them dull. <coughs> Jesus took the laws about Sabbath and made them serve the spirit of reverence for the Lord of hosts and the spirit of compassion for the needs of humanity. He took the law concerning moral behavior and made it serve the spirit of human sympathy and understanding. As we learn in the accounts in the Gospels, Jesus says to us, teaches us again and again, what are the two greatest commandments? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And everything comes down to that, rather than the, what are there, 600 and some laws um, in the Old Testament that the people, of the <coughs> Pharisees were trying to, say you have to follow each and every one of these to the letter. Jesus took, did not, and he did not leave us a code of laws in its place. No rule book which would tell us what to do in every conceivable situation. Jesus did promise to give all of us a spirit, which he called us the spirit of truth, and that spirit would guide us all into truth. He took for granted that situations would arise which he, neither he nor we can foresee. He did not go around the law. He came to fulfill the law, which he did, and he went above it to something infinitely higher, to the reality of God himself, to which each human being must respond in each new situation with all the vigor and spontaneity of which he or she is capable. So it wasn't meant to be an easy, it wasn't meant to give us answers, so we have to struggle constantly. No wonder from the beginning Jesus was accused of destroying the temple. In a sense, at least, he was doing that very thing. And in the same sense, Stephen, Jesus' follower, was doing it also. Um, it seems, inter Interpreter's Bible says, and I find it interesting, too, that all of these sources that I consulted were, some of them go back into the mid-1900s, so it's not new, in new information or new thinking about it. Interpreter's Bible says, it seems that Jesus did everything he could to ensure the flexibility of Christianity within certain definite convictions and beliefs. It's not a free form. 
It also seems that at times the church has done everything it could to freeze Christianity. Jesus promised the spirit of truth. That is what we want. Let us not be afraid of it. Stephen caught the meaning of Jesus and proclaimed that it is not the land, nor law, nor the temple that saves. From time to time, things need to change to suit the changing needs of God. What is God's purpose here and now? And that changes. God is the same, and he is the Savior, revealing himself in ever new forms to the eyes that are open to perceive him. Okay. Um, Continuing on about Christianity, once the system, which is, includes the ordered ministry, the canon of scripture, and our pattern of creedal belief was made, the house built, the old danger is always present. Namely, that we should suppose God's spirit to be impermanently housed, those outside the house to be totally apart from God, and the supreme necessity to be to preserve the house at all costs. So whatever it is. We can get upset that the wording of the Lord's Prayer has changed. We can get upset that ideas about who, uh, about gender identity have changed. We can get upset about all kinds of things and we need to continuously be examining it in light of what Jesus <coughs> taught us. So whenever we just seek to preserve what is at all costs. Wherever and whenever this has happened, Christianity has not only betrayed its Lord, who himself was caught and killed by such a system, but it has lost its power to save souls. The enraged accusers of Stephen descended upon him, and as they seized him, seized him Acts says, he was full of the Holy Spirit, and he gazed steadfastly into heaven, and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at God's right hand. So he said, look now, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Not necessarily, <coughs> excuse me, and the writers say we don't necessarily need to insist on a literal translation of this. And that's where I'd like us to go to our handout. Um, on page, on page two toward the bottom, um, under you see the letter two with the second toward the bottom. Um, would someone just read through that for us? There's several paragraphs there. Someone help us out there. Lee, where, where are you? No, page two toward yeah. the bottom, the bottom third. There's a there's a the numeral two there. Okay. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Reflect upon these words taken from the interpreter's Bible. Have you had similar experiences? What do these words say to you about God's presence in your life? The enraged accusers of Stephen descended upon him and they seized him. Acts says, he was full of the Holy Spirit and he gazed steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at God's right hand. So he said, look now, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. We need not necessarily insist upon a literal translation. Sooner or later, everyone goes through a time when life seems to be closing in on him or her. Then suddenly something happens that clears the air. This may be an event that takes place outside or it may be something that happens within the secret places of one's being. Whatever it may be, it is though the clouds broke and the heavens open. In spite of handicaps and obstacles, one is sure of one's ground. One can see the way clearly, one is ready to go on. It is the reassurance that God is good and that God's power, God's power a person can do all things. Love still reigns, love still matters, God still cares, Jesus came first. Can we continue? Yeah, would you read the next two paragraphs, please? <laughs> to say that such an experience is a common occurrence is by no means to cheapen it or to minimize its importance. It does not always occur on the same scale, but according to varying dimensions, it happens over and over again. Instances like these are, of course, only shadows of the greater thing. It is the vision of Jesus that truly clears the skies. It is the remembrance of him which fortifies our drooping spirits. 
It was serene when everyone else was beside him herself. He was forgiving when everyone else was vindictive. He prayed when the whole world around him was in tumult. He loved when he saw nothing but hate. He trusted when everyone was against him. He kept on hoping when there seemed nothing left to keep hope alive. When life closed in on him, it seemed as though his figure stretched itself until, like an arrow, it cleaved the sky in two, and through that opening, light has been forever streaming. That's a bunch. Yeah. <coughs> I just can read this over and over again. Um, anyone have comments or what has been your experience in life? I have never seen the heavens opening and, and Jesus at the right hand of God. However, I can relate to these experiences. Anyone else? I find it with, even as what I, I talked about today, um, the little things, and in, in, in the greater scheme of things, all of the events of this weekend are the little things. And at times, it's like my granddaughter said to me yesterday, Grandma Ginny, are you stressed out? <laughs> or are you feeling stressed? And I said, yes, I am. And Again, there have been so, ma so many people coming forth saying, can I bring you some food? Can, can, um, do you want me to plow out your driveway for you? Do you want to bring the kids and come sleep overnight? Do you want this? Do you want that? To me, that is, and for me personally, that is what divine inter intervention is, is the people around who are streaming forth that light of the love of God. And it just, every time it just totally, totally hits me, totally amazes me when I stop. And I think it's happening to all of us, but it's hard sometimes to just stop and recognize it or to note it and just say, oh God, here you are again. <laughs> you didn't put my power back on in a couple of hours, but this is what you've sent for me. This is how I see your presence in my life. So to me, these are, are words to kind of really reflect on. <coughs> and certainly, probably most of us can relate that to bigger things. And sometimes in the bigger things of life, it's very difficult for me to see that. And then I always come back to and I've said this many times, especially to my fellow Stephen ministers, I've said, I'm not feeling God's presence right now. It's just too much. But I'm relying on you all to hold that presence for me. I know in my head that the presence is there. It's not feeling like that in my heart. But I'm, not, I'm coming on you all to pray it, to be it, to do it. That's how I see it. Anybody? Anybody else have any comments on that? So, sometimes you don't know it when it's going on, but when you get the time to reflect, oh my gosh, it was. Absolutely, that's, that's thank you, that's, that's super profound, and it's super profound for me to, to, to hear that again. I have to really remind myself to, to go there. In the next part, we're not going to go into because it's time for us to finish up. So, but that's why I put it in your handout because I don't think it's any less important. Stephen's prayer. So, I I put that down as well. The whole thing about not only receive my spirit at the time of uh, at time of a great whatever it is, but also um, do not hold this against them. Um, so just pouring you back on to um, the first couple verses of Acts 8. At that time, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. It sounds like it was happening, 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 but then this might have been the catalyst that really created it. 
they were all scattered abroad throughout the districts of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Pious men carried Stephen away to bury him, and they mourned greatly over him. And that really hit me too. It's talking about the bigger picture of what was happening in the world. And within that bigger picture, one man's death had a great influence, and people were there to mourn him and to bury him and take care <coughs> that way. As for Saul, it says he ravaged the church. He went into house after house and dragged out both men and women and put them under arrest. We can only imagine what happened after that. Um, so Barclay says there are two especially interesting points in these couple verses. As Pastor Ann mentioned before, the apostles stood fast. They did not flee, but were men of courage and men who wanted to proclaim the gospel. Saul, as the authorized version says, made havoc of the church. The word used in the Greek denotes a brutal cruelty. The contrast between the man who was savaging, savaging the church in this chapter and the man who surrendered to Christ in the next is dramatic. The very next verse in chapter 8 reads, Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. So, as we know, the story continues and continues and continues. And we, can we close with a short prayer? Lord of hosts and Lord of love, thank you for our time together today. Thank you for revealing yourself to us in the word and in your daily revelations to us. Give us hearts and spirits to open to these revelations, to love you and to love each other. Amen. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for braving the, the storm and, and joining me today.